Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about the uh, anthropology of Ruby, uh, excavating this gem. About three or four years ago, uh, around the time of my first Ruby conference, second Ruby conference, I had the idea of let's take every single gem that's in Ruby uh, on Ruby Forge and uh, mirror it, open them up, extract all the metadata, and uh, then do a talk about it. Um, luckily enough, that talk didn't happen. But it's about you know four years later, and there's a lot more gems, and I figured, why not do that? Uh, unfortunately, I gave this talk the complete wrong name, because this is the anthropology. That's the study of humankind, not the study of gems. So we have gemology, much better term. Um, and what we're going to do is take a tour of the metadata and all the information that we have that's in Ruby Gems and see what we can find, if we can find out anything interesting, and if we can actually learn anything from it. So I have a project called Gemology. It's on GitHub now. Uh, put it up there last night. And it basically boils down to a Ruby Gems mirror. So how many people have ever downloaded every single gem on Ruby? Forge. All right, I know both of you. Three. Oh, I haven't met yet. All right. So it's actually not too hard. There's this great new Ruby Gems Mirror gem called Ruby Gems Mirror, um, and basically you can just download every single gem. It's the gem files themselves is about I think it was about uh, 40 gigs uh, if they're still as gem files. Um, if you extract them further, I for, um, I forgot someone posted how big that was, but I haven't extracted them all into one big directory now all at once. Uh, so you combine a, a mirror of Ruby gems with uh, a webhook. Does anyone use gem webhook? All right, we have two people. How many people actually know it exists? A few more, okay. Go to your man page. You should uh, do gem webhook dash dash help. So part of uh, gem cutter has the ability for you to subscribe to uh, any gem publishing. You can subscribe to a particular gem, or you can subscribe to all of them, and that's what this does. So we have Gem Webhook, which subscribes to every single gem push that happens. Every single time a gem gets pushed to Gem Cutter, uh, all the webhooks get called as appropriate, and I have one that sits behind Sinatra. Um, takes that webhook, throws a job on Rescue. How many people use Rescue? Yes, isn't that a great piece of work? Um, it fetches the gem from Gem Cutter, which actually ends up being from CloudFront, uh, grabs it, downloads it to uh, my slice, and then I, I have it on um, Rackspace, so it's in cloud files, stores it in cloud files. And then that kicks off another job, which extracts the metadata from uh, the gem. So how many people were at Eric's talk this morning? Oh, well, Eric, of course. So, for those of you who don't know, a .gem file is really just a tar file. And it has two files in it, metadata.gz and data.tar.gz. So the metadata.gz is a YAML file. And the uh, data is just the list of all the files that are in the gem. So it's a pretty simple and nice format. So that metadata that's in that YAML file, how many people have actually looked at a Ruby gem specification, like the full thing? All right, so we've got a few more. There's a lot of stuff in there that most people probably don't realize. Um, there's a lot of stuff in there. <coughs> so how many people have used Ruby Forge Project in their gem? Yeah, there's a few, yeah. There's a couple other interesting ones in here um, that not everyone knows. Do you know there's actually a license field in the Ruby gem spec? No one uses it, or maybe two or three. Huh? No, we should be using it. No, I'm saying these are things that we should be using. There's some interesting stuff in here that would be helpful to use. Oh, of course, then it makes it really easy. So, and then the other, another big one that people don't, uh, some people do, not a lot. How many people know you can you can cryptographically sign your gems? Yeah, see, the same dozen people are raising their hands for all this stuff. So yes, if you are worried about the security or just the Author the uh, knowing that a gem was signed by the by the author. Yes, you can sign your gem. It's in there. Is that like a, is that a PDF? What do I? <laughs> but just why don't you why don't you why don't you look at the man for for gem? And it's called I think it's called gem cert, and then you can look at it. 
Yeah, you know. it's best to use a felt tip pen. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, you can felt tip works out really well. Yeah. <laughs> but there's all this data in here, and I, and I really wanted to look at it and say, well, what can we find out from all of this data that's available for all of these gems? I mean, you know, the first one I thought of was, well, actually, one that's really important here is release date. Every time when you type gem uh, build, if you don't set it in your spec, please don't, then uh, the release date, the current date on your computer is stored in your gem. So the day you typed gem build is stored in the gem file itself. So let's start out with that piece of data and ask the question, how often do we, as developers, release gems? So you've been raising your hands. Let's go do it again. How many of you have a published a gem? Okay, keep them up. We're not done yet. We're going to find out how old you guys are. So, who has only published a gem to gem cutter? Oh, wait, wait, sorry. I'm doing it in the wrong order. In the wrong order. <laughs> Drop your hands if you've only published a gem to gem cutter. Okay, who's published a gem uh, since 2008? Seven. Six. Five. Oh, we still have four, three. Oh, okay, there we go. So you can't get any earlier than 2004. That's pretty much the rule. Um, although some people apparently have set their gems to have earlier dates. So that, that's one of the <laughs> Yes, yes, there, there, is, there is a gem out there that says that it was released in 2000. And now you've told us how to do it. So. Yeah, and, I've told you how to it, and now I want to tell you to never do it. It's just a wrong thing to do. So, we're going to start with the metadata of a release date. So we're going to start out with something early. So, Jim, Chad, Rich, David, and Paul put together Ruby Gems in 2000, or that was when 2003 was when it was born. The first Ruby Gem server went live in, I think, approximately late 2004. So this is a graph of every gem that was released by day in 2000, through the end of 2005. Um, sorry, apologies, this is a little at the bottom. But basically, at the bottom we've got months, on the side we've got gems released per day. Look up there. Between 2004 and 2005, there were 1,589 gems released. And we peaked over there, about 20 gems released in one day. That's a fair bit, you know, it's not too bad. Hey, it's, uh, looks like late February, maybe April, March of 2005, we had 20 gems released in one day. Well, how many of them were Easter eggs for this April? I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea if any of them were Easter eggs or not. But that's at the end of 2005. Let's go to 2008. So we extend this graph and go into 2008. And we see it's, it's been taken off. It's doing pretty good. Between 2005 and 2008, now we're approaching, this is now by month. Sorry, it, doing it by day doesn't work well in these graphs anymore. <coughs> so we get up here. The end of 2007, we're doing 500 gems publishing, 500 gems published a month, which is not too bad. So between 2006 and 2007, we have 7,949 gems as opposed to the, you know, I just forgot what it was, 1,500 from the previous two years, previous two years. So we continue on, it's now 2008. We have 2000, we add 2008 to the mix, and we're just, it's just skyrocketing. It's a nice curve here. We're doing, we're doing really good. 2008, on itself, had 9,000 gems. So, you know, every single year, we're getting more and more, every single year. So, who knows what happened at the end of 2009? Anyone? Yeah. No, Gem Cutter goes live. Oh, so late late this, November. Are these stats for Ruby Forge or for Ruby Forge plus GitHub? Uh, no, there's no GitHub data in here. This, is, this isn't actually downloads. This is publishing. Right. So yeah, this is the, the release date values. So this is missing all in any gems that people were just publishing on GitHub. Any gems that were only published to GitHub. Yes, that is true. Yeah, so GitHub said they had as many as Ruby Forge. So, but here's the really fun part. Late November, last year, I think about the 16th, uh, Gem Cutter goes live. I think it had an impact, don't you think? 
right here. This is Gem Cut. That's the day it goes live. I mean, January to October of 2008, we had 13,334 gems published. That's January to October. So those, those are the GitHub gems? Uh, these are still just gems that are available. I don't yeah, know where they're published. They may have been moved to GitHub. Gem Cutter pulled all of yeah. the gems. So I suspect that's pro a lot of that's because I can't imagine that everybody's waiting to write gems until. No, tomorrow. probably not. <laughs> but but this no, this is the release date. So this means the gems were repackaged. Right. right. So yes. Yeah. But this is just the end of last year. Now we go to November and December of last year. We have 7,649 gems produced, which is more than half those produced in the previous 10 months. Which is kind of cool. But, you know, you'd think this might be aberrant behavior if that was just gem cutter or just all the import from GitHub. It's not. This is through last night. Yeah, gem cutter. Since gem cutter has gone live, we have published 50,000 gems. That's individual releases. So, you know, any of you, gem that has, you know, 15 releases in the past year, that's 15 individual gems. So, give yourselves a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> or to put it in other words, in the five years before Gem Cutter, we had 34,000 gems published. In the previous year, we've had 52,000 gems published. I think this is pretty cool. And it shows that the ease of publishing a gem, because actually there's a high correlation between Gem Cutter and the ease of publishing and more gems being produced. What if we take out RVM? If we take out RVM? <laughs> RVM's not a gem. <laughs> um, so, but this means we're publishing 150 to 200 gems a day, right now. Yes, Stan? Sorry, in 2005, Yeah, the highest point in up to 2005 was 20 a day. The highest now is over 200 a day, but we're never dropping below like 100 to 120. Uh, then we're down to like four. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> now the fun part is if is if you take this and you're like, okay, so this is cool. We've got all these new gems. Does this does the same amount of uh, does the same trend uh, cross uh, boundaries? This is first releases of a new gem. So the first time a gem shows up. This is the same trend graph for the exact same period of time. You still get the, the gem cutter. New gem releases have also skyrocketed, which is kind of cool. Yes, first release of new gems. That shows the GitHub bump. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that first spike is. That first spike is probably the GitHub bump. Yeah, that very, very first one. But, I mean, you even go down here. It's, hey, right now, we're not too far below it. At 900 and some odd per month, you know, that's last month. We haven't even finished. We haven't even finished November, and it's well. The slope is a little off. So we're right now. We haven't finished November. Over, you know, six, eight hundred, something like that. Now here's the fun part. You take just the new releases of gems, but with we do these with first releases of gems, we can also figure out first-time gem authors. So these are people that have never published code before. You know, or maybe they have, but they haven't done it as a Ruby gem. So first time gem authors, of course, we've got our GitHub spike here. And that's a great point. I'm, I was trying to figure that out, but that is the GitHub spike where I didn't point all the stuff. So, but we still have, these are first time authors. So I have to say, this is kind of cool. We are encouraging mostly open source, all these are all probably open source license of some type, but we're encouraging open source uh, publishing of gems at you know, hundreds a month. First time publishing. I think about that, that's actually pretty cool. This is an encouraging of people producing and showing their work to the world. I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Now the fun part is when people are doing all this work and figuring out, you know, they're going to release something, when do they do it? I mean, well, we see that they do it all the time here, but what day of the month do they do it on? I mean, this, this is kind of a, just a joke graph. It's kind of fun, but you look at it and you go, Hang on, it looks like on the 6th of the month. <laughs> so whatever people are doing around the, the 6th, 7th, 8th, 5th, that's when people push gems to gem cut. I don't know why, who knows. 
I don't, I, this one I don't really like as much as the next one. Tuesday? <laughs> I mean, what's up with Tuesday? Why do people publish gems on Tuesday? Yep. You have an answer? Okay, so I mean, movies can't be released. Yeah, new movies don't get released on Tuesday. So we can just get gather and most of the gems can't be released on the first Tuesday. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. So you put these two together and we get that most gems are released on the first Tuesday of the month. So. Yeah, it could also be. Seattle RV meets every Tuesday. Oh, there we go. Seattle RV meets every Tuesday. There we go. That's, that's the right one. That's the right one. But it does show, hey, uh, we, we as programmers, we actually do sort of cut down on the weekends. Not much, but we do cut down on the weekends. Yeah, that's just the release, though. This is how the release. Many, how many of those people are working over the weekend? No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Everybody's working through the weekend and we're going to publish on Tuesday. Yes, there you go. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting data. I mean, I just kind of find this fun. <laughs> this actually is the anthropology show. Yeah, the, this is the anthropology of Ruby Gems. When do we put it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there we go. Um, but the next part is this This is kind of all fun and seeing, okay, when are we releasing, when are we releasing, how often are we releasing, and I think this is just awesome stuff. But let's switch to a different piece of metadata. What Ruby Gem version are we as developers using? So one of the pieces of metadata that shows up is the package Ruby Gem version published in the gem. And I forget, Eric, when did that go in? Um, I think that I made it save it. Okay, so around the 09 Ruby Gems time frame is when uh, the version of Ruby Gems was packaged into the gem. <coughs> so we look at that, kind of break this down. On the left hand side we've got a Ruby Gems version, and on the bottom we've got the count of the number of gems with that that have that value in it. So we can see, you know, well, 09 is where somebody somebody was doing it in 0811. That's kind of interesting. 09, but it looks like most people are using 135, 136, 137. But if you take this back to the uh, previous slide, which is when are all the gems been released? It's been in the past year. 135 was February 2009, something like that? I forget here. I don't know. No, but I looked it up, and these 135, 136, and 137 is about the last year and a half of gem releases itself. So this correlates highly with the actual just general exuberance in publishing gems in the past year. But it's kind of cool. We can still, see, I don't know what exact dates on these are, but we can see that these are the versions we've been using. Somebody's publishing gems with 1731. That's you? That might be me. That might be you? Okay, all right. So another question we might ask, how many, um, we've got pre-releases. How many people are publishing pre-release gems? I've done a couple. Yeah, yeah. So with pre-releases, we have metadata of the pre-release. So if you look at the source code, basically the rule for a pre-release is if the version has a letter in it, it's a pre-release. That's how it's determined whether it's a pre-release. Yeah, there we are. Letter has a letter has a version. In it. So if we look at just the pre-releases and say, hey, our pre-release is taking off. Well, yeah, it looks like it. So people are doing it. I mean, this is um, this is relief month, so it looks like in October we had, you know, maybe 300 pre-release gems pushed. Now another thing I have I didn't look I looked into a little bit, but I'm, it's not in this talk is how many people have dependencies on pre-release gems? Yeah, no, they exist. They exist. Believe me, they exist. I'm not sure how I feel about that. Hmm? In the, oh, that's another. That's actually a really good one to look at. How many gems that are not pre-released themselves depend on pre-release versions? So I'll look. I'll add that one to the list of things to experiment with and look at. Thank you, Ian. So we have pre-releases. People are using them. How many people find them useful? Use them. All right. Awesome. So we have extensions. Um, are extensions trending up or down? Are people doing more extensions or are they doing less extensions? Hmm? This is extensions. You can actually have Java extensions and C extensions and stuff like that. The way, the way you determine an extension is in the metadata is basically there's an extensions field and you put a file in. 
file name in it. And when the extensions run, it runs that file. So in this case, it's extconf.rb. Uh, or um, the, oh, I forget, there's two other ways you can do it. I think if it's just a rake file or a make file, both of those can be in there and it'll just run. So here are extensions. Actually, extensions have taken quite the skyrocket here in the past month. So uh, that's kind of interesting. So extensions, um, not exactly the same explosive growth as we had with regular gems, but we do have quite a number of, um, of gems with extensions. Now, this is a little, this, well, there's another question we need to have, a, have as a follow on here. So extensions trend, and there's 4,460 gems in Ruby gems that have extensions. Now the interesting part is, so extension, if your gem has an extension in it, it really can only be run on Linux or Mac, or something, or that's got the build features, because it's probably C code. Might be Java, you never know. Um, there's one that requires Python? Yes. Which one is that, James? Okay. Interesting. So there's one gem that uses Python to build the V8 engine, and it's got it requires Python in the extension. So hey, there we go. Um, but the interesting thing is, if we've got 4,460 gems that have extensions in them, shouldn't we probably also have approximately the same number that are uh, non Ruby platform? So we'll go into this. What platforms are gems being created for? Keep that other thought in your mind. So in metadata, there's platform. You know, it's pretty much just there. Um, you have to set it, uh, and there's some crazy stuff in that platform value. Um, so as you can see, Ruby is the dominant platform in Ruby Gems. Uh, not really all that surprising, but it's you know that's not informative because that that's just it blows out everything else in the water. We've got what eighty thousand gems that have Ruby, and everything else is less than a pixel wide. So we're going to throw out the Ruby data and see what we come up with. <coughs> So what we can see here is that the, the dominating um, gem platform outside of Ruby is x86 MS-132. So we have a growing one down here of Java. Yeah, right. Yes? This is unique gem. So a different version of the same gem would be in here as twice. Yeah, this, is, this is, does not include just the most recent version or anything like that. If it includes, um, it's actually harder to calculate on that. I'm working on the best way to do that. This includes every gem in existence, except for the Ruby ones in this graph. Um, so we can see that x86 MS-132 is by far the dominant uh, platform outside of Ruby, with Java coming in a close second and x86 Ming W32 a uh, third place, which is kind of cool. Now there's some interesting stuff in here. We got an x86 Solaris one up here. Not sure where that one came from. Um, if you are building gems, you should focus on the Yeah, yeah. If you are building gems that have a native component, uh, then you should be focusing on the uh, you know the x86 MS-132 one there. So Dr. Nick is talking about that, and he's promoting that. So if anyone wants to make gems on Windows, you know you can talk to Dr. Nick. He'll take care of it. <laughs> hey, you open your mouth, you know, I'm sending people your way. Some got lost in the country from Australia. Now, now, there's some interesting stuff in here. We've got some really small ones. We've got PowerPC Darwin, Spark Solaris, I mean, Universal, Universal.net. There's a gem out there that has as a platform Universal.net. All right. So, someone's making gems that will run on the CLS. Uh, and then, of course, we've just got uh, MIPS, Allegro, Excel, Unknown. And that, those must be pretty old ones. So. But here's the thing. We've got 2,333 total gems that have a native platform. And we've got 4,460 gems that have extensions. So, take note of this, people. We need to make sure that these numbers are starting to get closer and closer together. Um, so, are people making note of Ruby language cap incapability, incap incompatibilities? This basically means, are people taking note of the differences between Ruby 192, 19, 18, you know, going on down? Because one of the fields that you can set is the required Ruby Gems version and the required Ruby version. So if someone is publishing a gem, and I've encountered this several times, where the gem makes use of some language feature, like tap, that's the one that I encountered. A gem included tap in their code. I tried to run it on 186, didn't work, blew up. So, but there was no 
required Ruby version in the gem. So how was I to know that the reason this wasn't working is because uh, the Ruby, required Ruby version was uh, not set. So if we look at this, these are the gems that count. Um, the, a lot of the old gems, this wasn't actually put in uh, recently. When, do you remember what it was, Eric, on this one? So there's a lot of prof data in this piece. So we have 0 uh, and 0.0.0 .0 .0 are the um, junk data in here. So we're going to throw it out. And it looks like people are using it. So we do have the number one that people are using is setting the required Ruby gems version to 186. Yeah. There are also other techniques. I mean, yeah. there, my gems work in the few places where I do have Ruby language. Mm -hmm. In I just do it by having you know having to code there and. and yeah. yeah. So, so if, if you aren't doing this, it's easier in a lot of cases. You can you can uh, detect the Ruby gems version or the Ruby version itself in your code and then make allowances that way. But if you don't want to do that, or you, there's just too many of them, or it's all over the place, you know, this this is uh, this is the one thing you can do. But people have been doing it since 167, 168. Uh, 186 is the big one. I do like the fact that we have gems being released that are saying that they need to be 191 or 192 or greater. So the, the, those I consider the considerate folks who are saying, hey, I'm using the newer language features. Um, don't install this gem if you're using Ruby 186, which is kind of cool. I think those are considered. Now we go look at um, this is the required Ruby Gems version. So if you have code that requires a specific level of Ruby Gems itself uh, in order to function, um, this is what we see. And I forget if this is actually set specifically or if you have to set it yourself. Uh, and most of this is, uh, if you're using a development dependency, it does install the, it set this directly to 136, correct? One two, I think. One two. Okay, so that's the big one two. Because these are these are all gems that are using development dependencies because that was a feature added. If you set in your specification uh, a development dependency, then it will automatically set your Ruby gems required version to at least one two. So we can see that people are using you know the nice version, the bigger versions. But that's just kind of some of the interesting data that's just available in every gem. What we really want to see is. Whose gem is more important than somebody else's, right? <laughs> uh, so we're going to look at dependencies. But I have to digress and go on a small rant. Who knows what this is? You also know it as this. Yes, yes, twiddle waka is the appropriate term. It's a twiddle followed by a waka. Okay. <laughs> look it up. That's, that's, actually, some, that's, that's the term for that. Doctor next phrase, no, no, twiddle waka. Is, this is a twiddle waka. Um, now, this is a very important thing that you should all be using because if you have a gem and I say I depend on Wibble greater than or equal to 1.3, that means you can use it if Wibble 3.0 comes out and it will install Wibble 3.0. Wrong. Wrong. What we want is Twiddlewaka 1.2.3 or something along those lines, which means I can use any 1.2 system and it will not install 1.3. So people. Read these. Understand why. Thank you. I'll give you a moment. You can, you know, shoot a photo of this page and read these two websites. It's really good. You know, appropriate versioning is critical. When we're getting 50,000 gems in one year and the versions are screwed up, you know, that's something to a little bit worry. That's something to worry about. And to show you kind of how bad it is. Okay, so you can't see the bottom here, but that really tall one. Wrong. This is greater than or equal to. On runtime dependencies. You've got all the email addresses uh, I could. <laughs> and it has crossed my mind. Now, one, one of the things that I, I'll get to this in a minute, but uh, one of the things I want to do as a follow on to this is, uh, well, I'll get to it in a moment and talk about it. Um, that's wrong. And these guys are nice. Yes, they make me happy. You know, Red React development dependencies. We've got development dependencies that use greater than or equal to. Okay, yeah, that's not really going to work. But the development and runtime that are using Twiddlewaka are your friends. And these are people that are, that are considerate and understanding of the APIs that they depend on and making sure that they're compatible with those upstream APIs. Something you, every, we, should all be under, we should understand and figure out. So that's my dependency rant. Now I'll go to the runtime dependency graph. So this is what it looks like. <laughs> Yeah, there's not much you can see there. This is every gem, just the gem, not individual versions. This is the dependency graph between every single gem in Ruby Gems. 
Um, the blue one is the one that's got the highest number that it depends on. And it depends on it. Uh, people that depend on it. Yes. Uh, and my next few arrows are going to be in the wrong order. Um, so that's not no Gary. That one's no Gary. It's actually active support is the number one gem that has a direct dependency. No Gary is up there too, and so is Help. So there's a couple others, and there's like Abacus, A2WS, um, you know, but the one, the interesting one is, actually I didn't think it was going to be active support, so that was a surprise to me. What did you think it was going to be? I didn't know, but I didn't think it was going to be active support. I was actually thinking it was going to be rate or something along those lines. Um, but I haven't, I haven't traversed these graphs backwards, I mean, who does active support depend on? So should he get, you know, that weight should be transferred down to whoever active support depends on? So I haven't done any of that type of graph analysis, but I will. <coughs> well, people, oh, Dick, uh, Nick says that uh, they don't include rate because it's assumed. Well, I don't well, think that's about it. The other it. difference is that most people in Slot yeah. saw the rate check to get the rate command. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, most people in Slot rate to get the rate command. So the other one is that was the runtime dependency graph. Um, and to draw it, the, the tool I was using is called Tulip. I was just playing with it. Um, and the only way you can draw it is in three dimensions. So the other one is the development dependency graph. And that's what this looks like. This is, this is if you just include the developments. I, I, my gem depends on, has a development dependency on this other gem. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's so messed up. But the way this draws it is all those gems in a circle, they all depend on the one in the middle. So you can see that one with the red in it. Any takers on what that is? Say again? Oh, no. But we'll get Jeweler? Jeweler, no, no. We'll get to it in a minute. Ruby gems looks really highly connected. But... They're not. This is how dependencies work. So what we have down here on the, on the left hand side is the number of gems, uh, let's see, that, oh, let me draw this. Okay, we have one gem down here that 150 other gems depend on. There's one. The, and this is runtime, so we know it's active support. So, but over here on the other end, we've got over 1,500 gems that only depend on, or that are depended on by someone else, by one other thing. So this is a nice long tail, but this also means these are 1,500 gems right here that are published that also need to be worried about their downstream folks. And then it's just a pretty much a perfect long tail that shows up right down there. Yeah, active support. So we do the same thing, but with development dependencies. And we see we've got, there's one or two gems down here that 120 some odd other gems depend on. And we have a whole bunch over here, 400 plus, uh, that have one person that depends on. Well, and a lot of those are probably components of yeah. some of these other ones. Yeah, so that all, yeah, these could all be components. I mean, there's 400 of them. I didn't go into an analysis of what they all were. Right. But these are 400 gems that someone has said that this is a development dependency. You know, which is kind of cool. I think that's really cool. We've got there's a huge slew. I mean, there's a large there's a large number of gems in here that people depend on for development purposes. Uh, oh, this is the inverse. How many gems? So if I have a, if I have a gem and I publish it, how many gems do I depend on? So right here we've got. Well, let's do it this way. I've got one gem that has 40 dependencies. <laughs> now, now, when I tell you what it is, you're going to go, well, of course. It's the Rails Toolkit gem, which basically says, install this gem, and you'll install everything that we need for Rails. And that went way up with Rails 3. Yeah, I yeah. know. Yes. So this is just one dependency. You're not actually walking the graph. To yeah, I'm not walking the graph. This is just direct one, uh, one degree dependencies. But we have over here, the interesting thing is that first bar is zero. There are over 25,000 gems in <laughs> Ruby gems that have zero dependencies. Actually, that, de That's clear, cool. that declare zero dependencies. They declare zero dependencies, <laughs> correct. That's true. <laughs> they declare zero dependencies. So that's very true. But we do have 20,000 that declare one, which means that that's a, an explicit declaration of a, uh, of a dependency, which is, which is pretty cool. That means, hey, I'm making an effort to say I, I am depending on someone else and here's who it is. So yeah, we've got 25,000 gems with zero dependencies. So, 
What did we learn during the talk today? What did you guys learn? Anything interesting? No. Yes. Yes, a lot of people are not using Twiddle Waka to require active support. That might be one. That's a good one. Any other good ones that someone got? We know what Twiddle Waka is. We know what Twiddle Waka is. Okay. I'm for costume. I'm glad you got it. All right. That works. Now, for me personally, this is what I got out of this study. Um, I didn't mention any of it, but the gem metadata has junk in it all over the place. Um, author names. Okay, people, that's supposed to be an array. People are putting in like a CSV string, and so you get author name, comma, author name, comma, author name, comma, and it just shows up. And so it's kind of hard to figure out who the authors do, so if you do it programmatically. Um, encoding issues. So with Ruby 192, uh, every, the, the YAML file that's in here is supposed to be UTF-8. Not all of the YAML files are UTF-8. Um, I had to play some funky encoding tricks and try to do some stuff to, figure out, to actually read some of these because uh, the encoding. I mean, somebody encoded their file as Emacs Mule, which actually isn't even a <laughs> it even is in a code page. But there's a lot of stuff in here that's of different code pages, and depending on what Ruby version you're using, you can't actually read the gem or install it. So there's very few, but the gem metadata has some encoding issues that we probably should work on. Um, developers lie, yes. You know, nobody's published a gem that's in 2000, so that's the big one, you know. What, what the value that's in the metadata that you have control of um, sometimes you uh, you lie. So, um, Gem needs a lint command, and I'm I'm going to start it. So, I think you know we have a, you have. I, is anyone else here a Fedora contributor, Fedora packager? Okay, I, I do that. And there's a great RPM lint command. You've got your packaging as an RPM. You type RPM lint, and it gives you this list of warnings and things you're doing wrong in your specification, and files that are that are listed but are missing or. That, uh, are, that are are in there but not listed, that kind of thing. So we need a lint command that's gonna go through and say, okay, here's the right files, um, you know, all those sorts of stuff. Oh, another thing, we've got this whole system called test files. Yes? What about the initial lint command part of the gem build? Making the lint command part of the gem build. It does complain about some things, but not enough yet. Yeah, it complains about some things, but not enough yet. And sometimes it complains about too many things. And sometimes it complains about too many things. All right. It lies. It lies, yes. So, I mean, there's other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can do different things like those. Rating the gems based on the quality of their metadata. Different things like that. There's a lot of stuff we can do. But a couple of the big ones. One of them is um, the, uh, making sure you have a license in there. I mean, um, I didn't show it in here, but I, I tried to detect if a gem had a license in it, whether it had a license in the field or had a file that looked something like a license in the gem itself. We, I think we have five to 10,000 gems with no license in them. About the readme? Read I mean, I didn't check inside the readme. I was looking, oh, that's another thing. It's a really simple one right now. But yes, in the readme. So making sure that we have a license in the gem. I mean, that's important. If someone else is gonna use your code uh, in their system, they have to know what the license is so they can deal with it. Yes, another in the back. Yes, there is a license field in it that can be up to 64 characters long, I think, but no one uses it. So you can do that or just include a file. So I think part of this link command, I um, still want to figure out all different things we can go through it, but putting the license, um, making sure if you list files that look like tests, you actually put them in the test files section of the spec. There's a lot of people that they have their tests, their specs listed in the files, but they're not in the test files. They're just listed as, in, as included in the files. Yes. There's one case in particular where, where I have a lie by omission. Okay. A lie it has by to do with dependencies. Okay. I've got a gem and it requires TZ info. It doesn't care whether it's the TZ info gem or active support. After yep. Name. Sure. And as far as I tell, there's no way to actually put that in the gem spec. Yeah. To, to depend on TZ so basically info? basically say, to, to, no, to depend. I, I, I either need TZ info or I need active support. Uh, greater than so you need a dependency. Uh, a dependency on something that provides a capability. Yeah. So and RPM, that would be even more. Yeah. yeah. yeah and exactly. our, our RPM has something similar where you can say, I depend on web server. Yeah. And so if you've got Nginx or Apache. Yeah, that's one way to do it. Or just to say, either this, you know, some version range of TV info mm -hmm. or some version range of active support. Sure, sure. Uh, conditional dependencies, one right. or the other of this set. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the man talking back there, he'll probably take your patch. It'll be good. <laughs>
Um, so there's a lot of stuff more to analyze. I mean, we're just talking about a, you know, a bunch of different things right here. And so there's more to analyze. I want to do a, a more in-depth graph analysis to figure out, okay, um, how, you know, two levels deep, three levels deep. See, you know, is there a runtime dependency that depends on a, de on a development dependency to, to figure out, you know, these different graph analysis and see what you can come up with and figure out some inter uh, interesting information. Um, so that's pretty much it. It looks like I have a few moments for questions or more comments or more discussion. Yes? Yeah, I just want to point out, um, you were calling out things that people were doing wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it's odd that uh, Ho would be the third most, run, uh, the third biggest dependency uh, for runtime. Yes. Why is Ho a runtime dependency? I have no idea. Eric? So before development uh, dependencies, <coughs> Oh, that's right. So after, I feel like we still see it a lot, though. Yeah. So I just want to point out that there, there are a few old gems that were actually like old versions of Ho, so they show up as. Yeah, old versions of gem packaged with older versions of Ho, Ho because Ho uh, injected itself as a development as a runtime dependency because there was no development dependency at the time. Yeah, yeah. one other thing to point out, I think a lot of the uh, graphs and analysis that you did were really interesting for the most recent version of Yes, too. So yes. that we can see are things different. Yes, than and I, I definitely want to look at just the most recent version of GEMS. Yeah. Um, doing that is a little bit more complex with the data structure stuff I put together. So I, I may be blowing away my current database and re-importing it all. The fun part is, is that to download and import and extract all the metadata from here, on the you know 512 megabyte slice I was using to do the download and the import and the extract and that kind of stuff it takes about eight hours to do everything. Oh, one more critical piece of buggy stuff I saw in Gems. People don't package your package directory. You know the PKG directory. There's a couple of junk. Well, there's more than a couple who package their package directory. And in the package directory is the previous version of their gem that they didn't delete from the package directory. <laughs> and because that gem was packaged with the package directory, the previous version of that gem, so if you've got this recursive, there's a couple gems that are 100 and some odd megs, and I looked at it, and it's because, you know, 1.2 is packaged with the 1.1 gem in the, in the package directory, and the 1.0, and the 0 and the 0.9, and the 0.8. Well, the 1.1 is also packaged with the 0.9 and the 0.8. So, yeah, that's a feature. Thanks to James. So. Yeah, <laughs> don't do versioning. There we go. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank. I'd like to also thank Tom and QRS. They don't give me uh, snapshots of the appropriate databases, and I didn't use any of the data yet, but I will. So yes, Ted. Um, how many? Uh, did you look for any circular dependencies within Gems? Uh, I didn't look for them, but they exist. So the, the graphing tool I said, I said, um, are you circularly dependent? And it said yes. I'm like, okay, I haven't looked to see where it is. But yes, the we are not a directed acyclic graph as far as dependencies are concerned. But I'm going to find it, and I'll probably talk more about it. So thank you for your time. I guess that's all we have.